so my name is Zach. I'm a solution engineer here at Anomalo. Uh, thank you so, so, so much for coming to this talk. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me and the team at Anomalo. Uh, I flew all the way over here from uh, New York on a red eye, so it means a lot to me. Uh, you could have been at any other talk. So what we're going to be doing is I'll be talking about how machine learning can achieve data quality monitoring at scale. And the way we do that is we're gonna automatically detect anomalies in our data and find the root causes. So for the first half of this talk, I'm going to go over a backdrop of how we currently do data quality monitoring in the data stack and how we could do it. And then for the last 15 minutes, I'm gonna go into an actual demo uh, to see an example of what unsupervised machine learning would look like in action. So definitely save for the last part. Um, okay, so how I got here, well, I took a plane from uh, New York City, but how I got to become a solution engineer at Anomalo, I started out at a bank in the United States called Capital One, and this was right after college. I was a data analyst there, uh, and I'd always wanted to do data analytics, so I was really excited. But I quickly found out that over half of my work was trying to figure out why my analytics weren't looking the right way, why there were issues. Uh, trying to figure out where in the data they were happening. Uh, and then right from there, a couple years later, I go to a boutique analytics firm in hospitality called Calibri Labs. And then uh, I realized that 90% of the time that I spend at work is doing data quality issues, trying to find why they're happening. Uh, so I decide I like talking with people, so I end up working with clients. I go to an ad tech firm called Comscore, uh, and uh, I'm leading a team of data analysts and data engineers, and we have to do a, a custom implementation for a very, very large soda company. And for, a soda company wanted us to integrate our data with their data and a bunch of other third-party data. Uh, and they paid us a lot of money, so we're really excited for this. Uh, it was six months uh, of work. There are hundreds of hours put into it. And at the very end of it, I had to explain why, after them paying us $500,000, we had nothing to show for it. We presented absolutely nothing. And the reason being is because their data was so faulty, there were so many data quality issues with all these freshness and volume issues, nulls and metrics being completely different that we couldn't complete the project. Uh, and then finally, my last position was at Tableau. I was a solution engineer there. Uh, I was helping clients with visual analytics. At the time, I was in San Francisco and I was working with very major tech firms. Uh, and the one thing I saw across all those clients is, although they love doing analytics, uh, a bunch of the users had data quality issues and it prevented them from doing it. So my entire career has been completely plagued by it. Uh, so I highly empathize with the situation you're in, whether you're an, an end user or a data engineer. I really feel that. Uh, I actually decided to just quit working altogether and I did music full time for a year. Uh, and that went up in flames. So that is when I joined Anama. Uh, this is something that I, has always been a part of my career and I realized this is something that I wanna help fix, empower people to monitor data in a different way. So going into the, the backdrop of what the current landscape looks like with data quality monitoring. Uh, there's a few different pillars to the data, I mean, I mean to the modern data stack. Uh, and there are a lot of different places we can have data quality issues. So at the very first stage, at the very source, we can have issues. Maybe vendors are sending us data that's faulty. Uh, it could be the case that we're getting machine read data from payment systems or human entered data from surveys. Any of these can cause issues. But is this the only place that data quality issues can occur? Well, they can also occur at the data warehouse level. And this is really problematic. Uh, this is the source of truth for all the end users of the data, the analysts, the, the BI people, the product managers, the machine learning engineers. So if the source of truth isn't truthful, then there's going to be significant issues and we're going to make the wrong business decisions because the only thing worse than making decisions on no data is making decisions on bad data. And this can happen, of course, from ETL. The business logic could be wrong or it could have been implemented in the wrong way. And even at the final stage, at the very end, we can have anomalies being generated. We could have business intelligence reports that have the wrong calculated fields. Uh, they're either calculated incorrectly or they're put in the wrong place. We can have machine learning models that have erratic predictions. So there are a lot of, a lot of different ways for us to have poor data. 
Uh, now, do we want to monitor the data quality at every single one of these levels? Uh, well, that would take a, a lot of resources. It would be completely decentralized and hard to manage. Uh, so, uh, probably the best place to do it is to start by monitoring it at the enterprise data warehouse or the enterprise data lake. Uh, and the reason being is we'll be able to catch everything that's happening upstream and we can quarantine that data quality issue from going downstream. And so we know that any issue that occurs downstream that has to be generated by an end user, someone who created a BI report or someone who uh, did the machine learning model. And we can quarantine the data engineers can focus on that work and the end users know to diagnose their own work. Uh, because right now, uh, if anyone of you is an end user, you might find that uh, you're pinging the data engineer saying, hey, wait, why is this wrong? This looks faulty in the table. I actually spend hours and hours trying to figure out why this was happening. Um, so that's where it's occurring, but how do we currently do that? What's the status quo? Right before we go into what it could look like, what's the status quo? Well, the two main ways that organizations monitor data. And one is using validation rules, where we're looking at every single record. Uh, so validation rules would be things like, maybe I wanted to make sure that all the values in my number column are between the values zero and 10. Or I want to make sure that all the values are never null, or they're always unique. Uh, so these would be things at a very granular level. Uh, now, one good thing about these is they're very easy to understand. They're pretty simple to write. Uh, as long as we have a no-code way of doing it. Uh, but at the same time, when we start scaling our data, and as our data changes over time, these are going to be very brittle. They're going to start breaking as the data changes. Uh, and then we're going to start getting a lot of false positive alerts in whatever system we're using. Uh, and if we get too many alerts, that's essentially the same thing as getting no alerts, uh, because we're going to ignore them altogether. Then we got metric anomalies. And these are going to be KPIs, like business metrics. So these would be things like, I want to check the sum of my revenue or averages or counts, standard deviations. Now these are going to be at a high level. And as long as we're using a time series model, an intelligent time series model, then that will be okay. As the data transforms over time, the time series model will adapt to that. Uh, so we won't really be getting false positive alerts. Now I've seen a lot of organizations will track these metrics over time, uh, but they have those static thresholds uh, and they do get those false positives. But both of these, what do they have in common? They're both rules. We had to say, I'm defining this rule, now I want to create this check, and then I implement it. And then I get alerted based on that. Uh, and if I have an enterprise data warehouse of thousands and thousands of tables, and I have tables of hundreds of thousands of columns, how many rules do I need to write to feel confident in my data? And even if I do manage a way to automatically generate those rules, by the time the data changes, I'm going to be getting way too many alerts to be able to sift through them and find the ones that are important. So that's the status quo. Uh, what would a modern data quality platform look like? Why have we always been in the same paradigm of generating rules. Yes, a lot of new tools have come out over the last 20 years, but all of them have one thing in common is they're just giving us a new way to write different rules. Uh, so we have seen different paradigm shifts in the modern data stack over the last 10 years, a lot of them actually. So data warehousing, so I'm sure we're all aware we've moved to the cloud. Uh, so someone came in, a bunch of companies said, why are these people having to manage their own databases? They're, they're taking so many resources to do this. It's very difficult to scale, and it's, it's not working for an org. Why don't we provide that with them so they don't have to spend all that time and effort, uh, and they could scale with the C oops, sorry. We, they could scale with the CPU that they need, and they can manage the costs accordingly to that CPU. Uh, then we also have disruption in the ML and data science space, where either proprietary or open source tools are available to data scientists, machine learning engineers, in which uh, if I'm a data scientist, I no longer have to have a PhD in machine learning uh, and create my neural networks from scratch every time that I need to uh, do some data science. Uh, instead, I can leverage an entire community worth of people that have already created their own checks, I mean, their own uh, models, and then implement that in my specific use cases. And then BI, it's been really cool what we've seen there, where we've gone from essentially IT managed sharding, like Bob J, Cognos, and Crystal Reports, over to visual analytics tools, where we could self-service, like Tableau and Looker. And the real paradigm shift here is that instead of using visualizations to just be charts, to look at the health of our business, we're now using visualizations as an analytical method. We ask a question, we 
create a visualization. We get the answer. Now we make another one because we could keep drilling down. So where does that leave data quality value? How have all these other stacks in the data, uh, the modern data stack, been disrupted? And data quality monitoring hasn't. We're still on a rule base. Uh, after all, data quality is the cornerstone of making our business decisions based on data. Uh, if our data is faulty, we can't make good decisions. Uh, so uh, right now, there's a possibility. Uh, and the, the possibility is to challenge that status quo with a way where we don't have to be tied to rule-based monitoring anymore. Now, what this looks like, how we would do this is set of validation rules and metric anomalies. We would do this using unsupervised machine learning. And what this will help us do is automatically detect anomalies in our data without having to set up any rules. It will automatically find those issues and it will find the root cause as well. And it will tell me why this issue is occurring. Uh, and so this is going to be much more scalable. Uh, but not only is it going to find these issues, it's going to find them before I even know that I should be looking for them. Now, there's going to be checks and there are going to be anomalies that I know I should be looking for. I may have seen them in the past. Uh, but there's also going to be anomalies, there could be hundreds of thousands, that I never thought to look for. And those will be my unknown unknowns. And this is what it's going to look at. Now, uh, I might be tempted as an analyst, I might be tempted to say, oh, this is great. All right, cool. So I could have my rules, I could create my rules on my tables, and then after that, I could supplement it with the unsupervised modeling, which will catch those unknown unknowns. So, I mean, technically we could, but that's still under the same paradigm, where we are primarily focused in monitoring our data with rules, and then add another tool on, unsupervised machine learning as an afterthought. When instead what we could do is we can lean on unsupervised modeling to be the foundation of how we monitor our data. And then only supplement that with rules that are extremely business critical. So uh, here at Anomalo, in everything we do, we believe in challenging that status quo. We believe in thinking about data quality monitoring in a very different way, in which we're automatically detecting those issues. So let's go into the demo. I'm absolutely a believer in show, don't tell. Uh, so what we're gonna do is here I am in Anama, and I am monitoring this table fact listing. And what this table contains is ticket sales data for shows and concerts throughout the United States. So before I take a look at these actual checks, I'm gonna scroll down to this viz right here, this visualization. And what I'm seeing here is a profile of my data. So I can see a list of all my columns in my table. And within those columns, I get to see a distribution of the records. So for example, in my venue state column, I can see that it's quite common for venues to be located in New York and California. So in an enterprise warehouse, if I'm monitoring thousands of tables, I, it'll probably be pretty difficult for me to be an expert in every single one of them. And this will help me get oriented around that data before I start monitoring it. So a very first layer of defense, very basic. Uh, you may have heard the term data observability thrown around a lot in the industry recently. Uh, so these two would fall under that, which is a very shallow level of checking. We're just seeing, hey, is my data arriving on time? Is it complete? Maybe metadata checks. Uh, so data freshness is just going to say, give me an SLA, maybe 6 a.m. And what I'll do is every day I'll look at the table. And if your data hasn't arrived by 6 a.m., I'll send you a notification in Slack or Teams or PagerDuty or email. Uh, then data volume is going to say, I see at least one record is here for yesterday's data, but are all those records here? Uh, so, and this is all precursor to why machine learning is going to be important right at the very end. So data volume, what it's going to do is it's going to pull a daily count of the number of records historically, plot it over time, generate a time series model in which is predicting on any given day where the total number of records should fall between. And of course, it's using components of seasonality, using machine learning. So for example, if I get few records on weekends, this model will take that into account. It will decrease that expected range so we don't get false positives. Now, these are high level basic checks, uh, but we care about going a lot deeper. We're not just interested in observing where our data is and whether it's there, but we're interested in caring about the quality of the data. So Anama is going to use unsupervised modeling in two different ways. One is just looking to see whether values or records are missing in any significant ways. Uh, so this could be significant increases in nulls, 
in zeros. We can turn on empty strings, NAs, unknowns. Uh, and what makes this machine learning is that we're looking across all columns and the segmentations within the, in the columns and comparing it in clusters. So it's going to be much more variable and adapts to our data as it changes over time. Now, no drop in segment records is pretty interesting. Uh, what this is doing is, let's say in our data volume check, which was right over here, uh, the total number of records, let's say it doesn't change much day to day. Uh, but that might not be telling me the whole story. There could be drops within the data itself, uh, segmentation. So, for example, what would a segment be? A segment would be pop in my category name column. Uh, so let's say that uh, on one day it just drops 30%, and that was way outside of the norm. Anomal would say, hey, I see that the total number of records in my table is pretty much the same. It hasn't really changed much. But all of a sudden, pop dropped by 30%. That's really significant. And not only that, I'm also seeing that play has increased by 50%. So it could be the case that these records in pop were misattributed to plays. Or I'm also seeing these new segments were added out of nowhere. This segment could have been subdivided into these other segments. Now, we're one side of that coin is just looking to see whether values are missing. Table anomalies is going to be looking at a very deep level. It's going to be looking to see whether values change in any significant way, whether there's any significant drift. So I'm going to go into this at the very end and show you this in action, because this is going to be the biggest part. But brief overview of what this is doing. It's taking a sample of yesterday's data, comparing it in clusters to historical data, looking for that drift. Now, why this is so important is that if I'm a data engineer and analyst uh, in my current rules-based paradigm, let's say I have 100 checks running on every single one of my tables. Even if all 100 of those checks passes every single day, I still can't say with 100% certainty that there are no data quality issues in my data because there's a whole ocean of anomalies out there that I wouldn't know to look for, the unknown unknowns. So that's what this is gonna be catching. And again, I'll go into this in two and a half minutes, precisely. So this last layer of defense are our custom checks. These are our rules-based monitoring. We're not gonna forego them altogether. There's always gonna be a time and place for that. Uh, I won't lie and say unsupervised machine learning will catch everything. It's 100% true all the time. It's looking for significant changes in the data. Uh, but for example, we won't be looking at every single record because if we saw a change in records, we would have to send an alert and we could get a lot of noise. So. Uh, there are two different types. Key metrics are, again, the KPIs. So let's go to an example of if we have to create our own custom check, uh, I at least want to do it in a very simple and intuitive way. Uh, that would be easier for me. So let's say in this example, I am a BI analyst. I'm not a very technical user. I have an analytical mindset. And you know maybe I have some SQL experience, but I haven't really coded in Java or C++, for example. Uh, so what I want to do is I have a KPI that I really care about, and it's the average number of tickets I'm selling on a daily basis. Uh, and I use this metric to drive my business decisions. I have to report it to my vice president every single week. It's absolutely business critical. So I want to sell service. I don't want to have to go back to data engineers or software engineers and ask them to write a custom script in Python to monitor. Uh, they have their own backlog, and I'm the expert in this data. I, I, mean, I use it every single day. So what I'm going to do is click on this icon, and Anomal will present me with this interface. And what this interface is going to contain is over 100 out-of-the-box no-code or, at most, low-code checks. Now, of course, Anomal will scale with my technical capabilities as a user. I can absolutely write advanced custom SQL if I want. Uh, generally speaking, this is what a homegrown solution looks like, just this one check uh, where we're scripting. Uh, in this case, I'm a non-technical user, and even if I'm technical, I want this to be as simple as possible. So, uh, my average number of tickets, I'm going to scroll down looking for a mean. It looks like it's right here. Uh, so, we've done two clicks so far. Uh, and now all I have to do is select my column. So, click number three, click number four, and my number of tickets, and then five. That actually might have been six. I, I may have miscounted one. Uh, so, it's, it's super simple. I, I don't have to have any type of technical knowledge to be able to create my own check here. Uh, now, we'll see what this looks like in a second, but of course I have advanced options if I, if I need them. Uh, maybe I want to segment my data. I, I, maybe I only care about ticket sales in the eastern region of the United States. Or maybe I care about uh, customers who spend over $10,000 a year in uh, concert tickets. I could do that here. I could change the confidence interval to be narrow or wider of a band. Uh, or add hard limits to lower and upper bounds. So, I'm not going to add any advanced options. I'm just going to run from here. Uh, again, we didn't have to have any coding experience there. 
Uh, and I'll briefly touch on validation rules. And let's see, this may have actually finished pretty quickly. Okay, yeah, that finished really quickly. So, uh, we just generated a bunch of stuff after we asked Anomalo to track our average number of tickets. So, what Anomalo did here is it generated the metric, average number of tickets, it plotted it over time, created the time series model in which it's saying, hey, you, you told me to do this at a 95% confidence interval. I'm cool with that. I'll do that. Uh, and it's saying, hey, normally these values are somewhere around 10, but all of a sudden they shot up to over 13. Now, I, I probably just got an alert. Okay, so promise I'm not cheating. This just came in at 1.40 p.m. This is 1.41 p.m. I didn't set this up ahead of time. Uh, and I'm seeing this in as an alert in whatever messaging system that I'm using. Uh, so Slack uh, is gonna be much more intuitive for me than if I, I have to go through some complex software engineering channel. Uh, so I can see the visualization. It's very simple to understand. Uh, so heading back into the platform, uh, what did we just do? We clicked a couple times, it was like five or six times, and we generated a time series model, visualizations, alerting system, detected an anomaly, all of that. Uh, so if I do need to create custom checks, then this will enable me to do that. Uh, now validation rules are gonna be the other part of this, where we wanna determine every single value is following a rule. Uh, so some of these, it looks like a user has already created a couple of their own. Uh, one of them is saying, hey, I wanna ensure that the values in my price per ticket column are always between zero and nine. And if that's ever not the case, I wanna be alerted. It looks like a fail. Um, I also wanna make sure all the values in my list ID column are unique. All the values in my list, ID, list time column are never null. Uh, this one's saying, in my venue state column, if there's ever a new value in there, I wanna be alerted because there should always only be 50 values. Um, if there's a 51st value, uh, if there's only 50 states in the United States, I knew something's wrong. There, there should always be a constant state. Uh, I mean, just like uh, my Yorkshire Terrier, Daisy, who lives in a constant state of anxiety. A uh, little bit of a different matter though. So, uh, these checks right here, this one is saying when I multiply column one by column two, it should always equal column three. So, uh, this is giving me a non-time series model because we're, we're just looking at yesterday's record. This is very basic visualization, which is saying, hey, I expected zero records to fail, but actually 233 records failed. Now, if I'm an ML engineer, this makes it really easy. Uh, this saves me a lot of time in that I don't have to spend a lot of time building my models to training it on years and years of data, only to find at the end that something looks way off. And that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is I don't find that something looks way off, even though something is, and then we make a business decision on that. Now, when I was an analyst, my least favorite part of the job was trying to figure out why an issue was occurring. I always wanted to be doing analytics instead. So my favorite feature in Anomalo is the root cause analysis, which is gonna be using machine learning. Uh, so automatically what this is telling me is it's saying 100% of the bad records in my data set, and the bad records are these 233 records that didn't pass this track. And Anomalo is saying, do you know what all of those records have in common? They happen to have a venue state in New York. But at the same time, only 26% of the good records, and those being the records that pass the check, have a venue state in New York. So this is such a wide differential between the percentage of bad records and the percentage of good records that are in the venue state in New York that it's extremely significant evidence. This is exactly why my data issue is occurring. It's coming from these records upstream where the venue state is in New York. So not only is this saving me time in figuring out that there is an issue, saving me time in figuring out why the issue is occurring, where in the data it's happening. Uh, and beyond that, there's some nice app features, uh, exposing some sample bad records that I could scroll through. I could download them. I could even expose the SQL. If I'm a data engineer and I care about automating my pipeline, I could use the REST API to pull this out uh, and quarantine these records if I need to, or just copy and paste this into my SQL editor. Um, now, going back, the last thing I wanna cover, which is the whole point of this discussion, is although we were using some machine learning here in these checks, uh, we still had to create rules. And that's very difficult to manage at scale at enterprise data warehouse. I can't do that for thousands of tables, hundreds and thousands of columns. Uh, so what I need instead is a way to automatically detect those issues. So this is a new way of thinking about data quality. Uh, so 
Table anomalies, this is the unsupervised machine learning check that's going to be looking for significant drift. So, um, what this is showing me, Anomalo is saying, hey, I found a really strong anomaly. All of a sudden, in my number of tickets column, the value 40 shot up out of nowhere. Now, we saw earlier that the average number of tickets, this was the average, is generally around 10, and then it shot up to over 13 for yesterday's data. So if I hop back over here, the value 40 increasing is probably correlated in some way. Now, uh, with unsupervised modeling, it's always important that I don't just spit out a bunch of numbers. I want to make sure that it's easy to understand and easy to communicate. So Anomalo provides visualizations to do that. Uh, here it's asking, was this just occurring for a particular portion of the day? Now it looks like in this case it was happening throughout the entire day. Uh, then it's going to give me a tornado plot. It's saying, hey, what if I took the most commonly occurring values in my number of tickets column and I compared yesterday's data to the data from the day before? Now, for most of these values, they really don't change much day to day. But all of a sudden for the value 40, Anomo is saying that it went from 0% of the records to over 10% of the records. That's pretty severe. Now, this is a demo environment that I'm constantly refreshing. So this unsupervised model has only had one data train. Uh, so if I'd been training it for a longer period, it would be able to look back at different intervals like 7, 14, uh, 28 days. But the very best part about this is that it comes up with the same exact root cause analysis that we saw earlier. Now, why this is so important is that if I hadn't known to create a check for this very specific type of anomaly, and there could be hundreds of thousands of types of anomalies just in this one table, if I hadn't known to create the very specific check for this very specific type of anomaly, anomaly would have found it for me anyways. And not only that, it would have told me why it's happening. It would have given me the root cause. So just to summarize what we went through, the, the paradigm that we've been under in the, the data monitoring space is one where we have to generate rules. And although there's so many tools that have been coming out over the past 20 years that give us new ways to do that, new UIs, new types of checks, they're still founded in rules, which can take a lot of time and might not be scalable for my enterprise. Uh, so we want to shift, we want to challenge that by leaning on unsupervised machine learning. Uh, to automatically detect those issues. So uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Uh, it means a lot.